Hey everyone, Mr. Corrigan here. So, usually we begin the show with the Crystal Ray theme song, but due to the serious nature of this episode, we're going to begin the show uh, differently. We're going to go back to that day, two decades ago, September 11th, 2001. Try to visualize it. The day starts like any other, no one yet realizing that the date, September 11th, will soon take on a meaning no one could have ever expected. It's 7 a.m., and an ABC Good Morning America begins. Today, jury selection begins in a critical phase of the trial of Andrea Yates, accused of drowning her five children. Plus, superstar Michael Jordan in the news, the strongest words yet from Jordan, that he will be back. Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. I'm Diane Sawyer, and it's Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. Michael may be back. He's saying Fast forward one hour and 46 minutes. It's now 8.46 a.m. We want to tell you what we know as we know it. We just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the World Trade Center in New York City. One report said, and we can't confirm any of this, that a plane may have hit one of the two towers of the World Trade Center. But 16 minutes later, 9.02 a.m. It, it, it does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God. That looks like a second plane Dear has Lord. just I didn't hit. see a plane go in. That, that just exploded. We I... just saw another plane coming in from the side. 28 minutes later, President George W. Bush addresses the nation. Today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Seven minutes later, a third plane hits the Pentagon. The Pentagon itself has caved in from the top. There is much fire uh, coming out of the windows. Uh, it looks like uh, something from World War II, Peter. 22 minutes later, it's now 9.59 a.m. Peter, it's Don Dealer down here. I'm four blocks north of the World Trade Center. The second building that was hit by the plane has just completely collapsed. It started with a gigantic rumble, folded in on itself, and collapsed in a huge plume of smoke and dust. Four minutes later, 10.03 a.m. And I'm just going to add to the chaos and the trauma of the day by saying that a large plane has now crashed about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. 25 minutes later, 10.28 a.m. Oh, my God. The second, the second tower. It's hard to put it into words, and maybe one doesn't need to. New York City has just been changed. And one has to assume that thousands of lives have been extinguished. Good Lord, it just... Now let's fast forward again, back to our time. And here are the hosts of the Crystal Ray podcast. Hi, guys. This is the Crystal Ray Podcast. You are now listening to Jaleel. And today I have my co-host with me, Rebecca. Hi, guys. Ava. Hey. And Alanga. Hello. Today we'll be commemorating the 20th anniversary of 9-11. We have a special guest with us, Miss Munchler. Hello. She was there during the time of 9-11 and um, can tell of her personal views and um live experience. So um, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it, guys. Yeah, so we wanted to pick your brain a little bit, and can you tell us, like, what happened, not what happened, because we know, but, um, like, what, where were you during that moment? Like, how were you feeling? Like, explain, like, set the scene for us. Basically. Sure, sure. So um, I was living in New York during that time. Mm -hmm. I was actually living in Brooklyn, but my job was in Manhattan. So every day I took the subway in to Manhattan to work. I was working at a law firm that was located in Rockefeller Center. So that's like in Midtown Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of in the middle of everything. Um, so that day I got off the subway um, and I was walking to my office and I saw a bunch of people looking downtown, which was really weird because usually New Yorkers are just like doing their thing, going about their business, mm -hmm. not paying attention to much, just like, I got, I need to get where I need to go. Right. Um, and so everybody was looking downtown. And so I looked and you could always orient yourself in New York by the Twin Towers mm -hmm. because they were just so tall. So no matter where you were, if you could look around and you would see them, you'd be like, okay, I need to go. This is South, you know, or whatever. Um, so I looked downtown and one of the Twin Towers was smoking, was on fire. Um, and so at that point, somebody said, 
Well, I heard that a commuter plane ran into one of the twin towers. It was an accident. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, wow, that's really, that's awful. And so then I went up to my office and I was sitting down, um, you know, I was getting coffee or whatever. And then all of a sudden somebody ran down the hallway and said, oh my gosh, the second tower has been hit. And so then I called my husband because he worked near the Empire State Building. And I said, I, I don't know what's going on, but I think we need to get out of here. This is Mrs. Wright in Advancement. In 2001, I worked in the development department at the Columbus Zoo. On September 11, 2001, I was in St. Louis attending the National American Zoo and Aquarium Association Conference, along with about 30 other employees from our zoo and 600 zoo colleagues from around the country. The night before, there was a huge gathering of attendees, enjoying networking and a great night. No one knew what we were about to wake up to the next day. I was excited because I had some free time the next morning and I was going to go see the arch, which was across from our hotel. I woke up the next morning early, turned on the Today Show on the TV at around 8 a.m. to get the news headlines and saw live coverage of something happening in New York. I then saw the footage of the plane hit the tower and later another and then more news and different live shots. Something was happening in Washington, D.C. Something was happening in the air over Pennsylvania. My room became a place where other co-workers came and hung out, and we watched, in shock, horror, and disbelief, like so many others around the world. Phone lines were busy. You couldn't get through on cell service. Many of us were trying to call home to let family know we were okay, see if they were okay, and were they watching what was happening. In addition to those of us at the conference, there was a zookeeper flying from Belgium back to the Columbus with a pair of bonobos, a type of great ape, as well as a Belgian keeper. She was in the air just coming into North American airspace near the island of Newfoundland when this all happened. September 11th was supposed to be the last day of our conference. After the attacks, the rest of the conference was canceled. At that point, there was a lot of scrambling going on. People wanted to leave and were trying to figure out how they were going to get home overwhelming transportation. And then the airports were shut down. Back in Columbus, the assistant zoo director was working on logistics, how to get those of us in St. Louis home and what was going on with the keeper in the air. He sent a message out to staff asking for volunteers to come and get us. And within a half an hour, eight people had volunteered. Four vans were sent to drive to St. Louis to get us. Meanwhile, the zookeeper's plane was routed to Gander, Newfoundland. If you've heard about the musical Come From Away, it's about what happened in Newfoundland during 9-11, and our zookeeper and the bonobos are a part of that story. Our co-workers arrived later that night, and we all left the next morning. Looking up to the sky was eerie. No contrails from airplanes as they were grounded, and silence. It was a surreal day. Twenty years later, I feel the same shock and sadness as I did then. And then somebody else ran down the hallway and said, they've hit the Pentagon. Oh. Um, so the Pentagon was then hit. So I left um, the building. I just like ran out without any of my stuff. And my husband and I met each other at, at a place. You mm -hmm. know, yeah, yeah, we yeah. prearranged that. And then um, we went to his sister's house. She lived downtown. And we saw like while we were walking downtown, um, they, the towers fell. Wow. And so we started seeing people walking past us going uptown with like just covered in dust they were just all like like just covered um and the weird eerie thing was that in new york like it was quiet it was just Ooh. like silent and people were just kind of like passing each other but not saying anything like everybody was in a daze it was really really um eerie yeah. and then the train stopped running and so there was just like all these people kind of like trapped um and we ended up having to like walk home that night over the Brooklyn Bridge. And you could see in the air, there was just this like plume of mm -hmm. this like of stuff. And it was papers from the, that were like in yeah. debris from the, the yeah. towers being on fire. And when we got home, you know, we lived like a mile away from the twin towers across the river and our apartment was covered in dust. And there were like papers burnt, like memos and papers mm -hmm. on our back porch, which was really bizarre. And then like afterwards, there were people um, hung up like posters on the telephone poles and like all over the place of like missing people. Mm -hmm. And so you would just see all these like flyers of missing people that you knew um, eventually 
we were never, they were never going to be found. So it was really, really That's weird so living there. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I never knew that people would have missing posters. Like, like, yes. Like, adds to the oh, like. Yeah. They were all over the place. Hi, everyone. It's Miss Salinas. I remember exactly where I was on 9-11, as anyone who was of age at that time would. I was a young teacher at Thomas Sumter Academy in Sumter, South Carolina. And it was a school that had uh, a lot of rural South Carolina kids, but it also had a lot of Air Force kids. Um, There was an Air Force base there, and I remember that all of us, when we heard the news of what was going on, started packing into a handful of classrooms. We still had the kind of TVs that you rolled in on a cart, just like a regular TV. And I remember we were in the science lab. There were about three classes packed in there. And I remember the silence of the room, that no one was really speaking. I remember that uh, one of the older teachers said that she was just staring at me Um, for a large part of the time, watching me try not to cry uh, the entire day because we had so many kids who had connections at the Pentagon and spent the day not being able to get in touch with people they knew and who could have lost their lives on that day. Thank God none of our kids did lose anyone on that day, but of course we didn't know that at the time. I remember just wanting to get home and wanting to get in contact with everyone I loved. I remember there was a sense that we weren't sure if this was just the beginning, that there might be more coming. I was worried that Sumter was an Air Force town, and so therefore maybe it was a military target. I know that probably seems a little far-fetched now, but on 9-11, things that had never before seemed possible in our country, all of a sudden seemed possible. And then they had, um, like along the Brooklyn promenade, they had like candles that were burning, like for, that people had re- came down to light for their loved ones. How long after that did you stay in New York? Um, I was there for, let's see, when was that? for four more years after that. Did you, what big change did you notice during that time period? Um, the big change that I noticed for about the next, six months, um, there was just like definitely a heightened state um, throughout the city. And so like anytime I would get on the subway that people were very like on edge. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times there would be like you, the subway would stop because there was a police investigation or like there was just like a lot of heightened awareness. There certainly was immediately um, an anti-Muslim, a lot of racism that started happening. at, right after that so how'd that make you feel like first like you and your like husband experiencing that and having to walk in as well as like the anti-muslim um like how did that feel because like as much it, as it is still very much present today i think i feel like sometimes i feel a little desensitized to it mm-hmm. until i'm actually like in the face of someone who is like who's practicing like who's muslim you know so how did that make you feel like how did it, how did it make you feel Um, bad. I mean, it was, it's terrible. It's not right. It's unfair. Like all those, the sense of injustice that you feel about that one feels about, um, racism of any type, you know, Mm -hmm. but it was just the fact that it was just so immediate was like pretty shocking and like disappointing that that would happen. This is Mr. Rose, 10th grade school counselor. And my recollection of September 11th was almost as if it happened yesterday. I was in college at Bowling Green State University and I was exiting a telecommunications class on the second floor of the building. And as I came down the stairs, uh, I recall looking to my left and there happened to be a TV there and I seen a building on fire, which caught my attention. Of course, I went over to the TV and uh, didn't take long for me to realize that it was the towers that were on fire. And as we stood there, we actually saw the second plane go into uh, the building. And um, 
as more people gathered around, we all kind of stood there and watched as the buildings uh, eventually came down. Uh, this really stuck out to me uh, because we were scheduled to play South Carolina um, that Saturday in South Carolina, and they were the number four rated uh, football team in the nation, and we were playing under uh, newly acquired uh, coach Urban Meyer, and for some reason we really felt that we were going to win that game, and because of the acts that happened on September 11th. That game was canceled as all travel was grounded and we were never able to play that game. Uh, that day will always be in my mind. I don't think I will ever forget, uh, you know, the kind of place I was when this all happened. And it's something that I hope future generations never have to deal with uh, something so, I guess, earth shattering and something that is so monumental and uh, so big that it literally stops the world. So that's my recollection of uh, September 11th um, and I appreciate all of the men and women uh, that sacrificed themselves um, for the good of their neighbors and it was a time that the whole country uh, actually came together and I hope that we can all come together again as we were during those times. So as a person who has been in almost um, a similar situation, um, I grew up in Congo where we had a lot of terrorism um, and we'll have some of our neighbor countries such as Rwanda will um, bring like throw bombs into the town that I lived in. Um, and I know how it feels to be like scared for your life and um, stuff like that. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, how did you like when you, you when you heard what was happening? How how how, how was your mindset at that moment like, when you heard what was happening? Because I know um, for me, I, I cannot think of anything else other than like are the people that I care about safe and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But like, how was your mindset? Like, what was the first thing you thought of? Yeah, I was incredibly scared. Um, yeah, I, thought, I picked up the phone and called my husband. I was worried about, I, yeah, it was just like total fear. And then also wondering when will things ever change? Will things be different again? Will things feel okay again? That feeling I think is very similar to how a lot of us felt at the beginning of COVID as well. Yeah. Um, although these are two very drastically different situations, I think that just the feeling of like the unknown in itself is very, very, very scary. Um, circling back to like what you said about how like we feel about the situation itself, I think that since we weren't there, we're kind of all uninformed to an extent. Like we don't know the feeling, we don't know exactly how to feel. But um, a lot of us do, or we do have like um, Muslim friends, and we see how they're treated. And like I think a lot of us saw like the aftermath of it. I think that. There should definitely be more um, more information talked about on 9-11 as a whole. I feel like we all just get played the video of like the CNN, big old um, mm -hmm. Fox News, breaking news, um, teleprompt and all things like that. But we don't really like get to know like who the people were. Hi, this is Mr. Wynn. I was a senior in high school and we were just about three weeks in into my final year of high school. And I remember that morning vividly. I had theology, first period. I remember where I was in the room. I was sitting towards the front and close by the door because the announcements came on, which was really unusual. Uh, we never had the principal or the president come over the announcements unless it was like, big news that needed to be shared. And the news was that there was an attack in New York and it involved the World Trade Center. And the details were pretty murky, but that's what the principal was able to share over the announcements. And they just informed us to continue with class and move into second period when the bell rings and they'll keep us updated throughout the day. Naturally, there were 20 minutes left in theology and no one did anything 
know, whatever we were learning stopped, and everyone, I think, was just in a state of shock. We just sort of started looking around and talking to each other and wondering what this was and what it meant. The bell rang, and I went right next door. My class was next door, and this one was calculus. And our calculus teacher, Mr. Fox, noticing sort of how distraught we were, and I think he himself was pretty distraught or just confused and uncertain. He said, hey, at the beginning of class, like, would you all prefer to watch the news instead of calculus today? And of course, we were said absolutely. So each of our classrooms at the time had, you know, this is really pre-flat screen TVs. So this is like these big TVs in the corner that were connected to cable. And so we turned on CNN and there just right on the news was just all this coverage of smoke coming from the towers. We were learning just in like in that time that a, a plane had hit the World Trade Center. And we saw when the second plane hit the other tower, which was absolutely shocking. You could hear a, a pin drop in that classroom. And we spent the entire time watching the news, so we watched and just were kind of soaking it all in, and then the first tower collapsed. And that's when our teacher decided to have us take a break and shut off the news. You know, to his credit, he led us in a prayer and gave us space to kind of share our sort of thoughts and feelings, which were very scattered at that moment. And you know, we just, we did zero calculus that day. We just talked and prayed and thought, you know, this is 2001, so, you know, senior in high school, we really didn't have cell phones, so we just had each other to kind of talk to about it. And I remember just sitting in a daze, uh, just in lunch. You know, I had no family in New York, never really been to New York, but I just remember feeling just tremendous sadness about what I had seen on TV that morning. I don't even know what the, like, I know, like, I don't know. The I would numbers. guess like the World Trade was trading, like, the World, part trade, of the trade, the World trade, trade Center. Yeah, we don't know what, like, I don't know what exactly was going on, you know, how many different departments there are. We don't know really what that, what, who those people were, what they were doing, what they were mm -hmm. working for. We just know of, um, yeah, we just know of the tragedy. We don't know the story. Lots so of I think people, that fire, yeah, we need to, we need like to we know the more. general concepts. We don't know like every detail, and that comes with like most stories. It's just I think it's a little harder for me to feel like connected to other or like older Americans that went through this tra tragedy. And sometimes I find it hard to like comfort people mm -hmm. because I'm stuck in this place of like feeling bad for the people that die, but also feeling bad for the Muslims that had to deal with that racism mm -hmm. and that hate and that like, like confusion, you know? Mm -hmm. And it really leaves me in a place where it's like, wow, like what am I supposed to say? Like, how do I comfort you while not belittling somebody else, you know? I like that. And, I like that you brought that up. Because like trauma. That's yeah, really, it's like, really traumatic yeah. for both parties in a way that I don't think people understand. Like it had to be it, like you, like in New York, like you were scared, you called your husband. Like it had to be traumatic to go through that and to fear like, oh my gosh, if I walk through this bridge or something happened, mm -hmm. who, who can I trust? You know, like things like that. And thank God that you had like, um, you said your husband's sister, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, thank God that you had, like, you know, somebody there. But, like, imagine those people that didn't. And then those yeah. people that were putting up those missing yeah. posters. Mm -hmm. And that was all they had. And those kids that are now didn't have parents. And just everything all combined. It just yeah. seems so, like, it seems so far away, yet so present in my face, you know? I'm glad that you mentioned that. I mean, I want to, I really want to focus on how you talked about how you, um, you even opened up about how you felt bad about like feeling bad for one group of people without feeling bad for the other. Because I feel like oftentimes, just as people in general, we do that within ourselves. Like we, 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 we hate to feel bad for one group of people that you know spread hatred, but you know we still have to feel bad for the victim. This is Mrs. Capsh, and on September 11th, 2001, it started out as any other normal school day. I was 14 years old. I was just in the first few weeks of being a freshman in high school and finally made it into high school. And I remember going, putting on my school uniform that morning and getting into the building, sitting through my first period class, just like any other day, and then moving to my second period class. It was during the middle of that class period that an announcement came over the intercom telling us that there was something going on in New York City. There wasn't a lot of detail over the intercom at that time, but they had mentioned that there was a plane that had flown into a building. And I don't think at that moment in time, people knew exactly 
what was going on or what was happening. But I do remember I was in the middle row, almost smack dab in the middle of the classroom was where my seat was. And I just remember being there and I remember feeling a lot of confusion and a lot of uncertainty. In my 14 year old brain, I wasn't quite sure what was happening. And I remember wondering like, does life just like what what happens now like do I just continue throughout my school day and then just get up tomorrow morning and go to school again or how is this going to affect the rest of our our week just because we didn't I didn't have all the details yet I didn't know what was going on I remember our teacher turning on the television and I remember seeing the second plane crash into the tower and I think it was really at that moment that there was some more clarity that this just wasn't like an accident. I went to a Christian school and so I remember going into the gym after this had happened and there was like a church attached to our school and I remember that there were a lot of prayers happening and like impromptu almost prayer service happened just for the individuals in New York City and all that was going on. But the main feeling that stuck with me more than anything was just like, what now? I think I just wasn't sure what was actually happening or what would happen next. You know, we eventually heard about then the flight that went down, I believe it was in Pennsylvania, and then the Pentagon was also attacked. I just remember all of these different events happening throughout the day. And it almost felt like, well, what's next? And I remember being fearful and coming home early from school that day and just sitting with my parents and kind of talking with them about some of what was happening. But mostly just an overwhelming feeling of confusion and fear and sadness, complete sadness for all that was going on in New York City and for all the people that that this attack affected, directly affected that day. I remember watching on the news the the essentially the cleanup that started happening and the firefighters that were working and the first responders who were working as hard as they could. I remember seeing images of it all over the news for weeks to come. But yeah, I was in my second period Spanish class uh, my freshman year of high school. So how do you guys like to navigate through um, feeling bad for the victims while also um, keeping in mindfulness the act and like what it, what it was within itself. You know? I think we have to realize that pretty much everybody here was a victim. Besides mm -hmm. like obviously the people that participated and, and like, you know, there's still certain things happening um, in Afghanistan. Um, and of course, America had their part to play in that, which we typically do. But like, I think that we have to start looking at people as like, like, I mean, they are victims, but we have to see them past their trauma. Like, that's not all they are. You know, they're not mm -hmm. just that one moment that happened. There's so much more. And all that, though that one moment happened to them, like, there's still greatness. Like, Ms. Mutchler represents greatness, even mm -hmm. though she's been through that traumatic situation. Like, anybody she tells this story to, like, we're going to be great because we know about this story. And we, we understand and we're actively, like, seeking to understand, you know? So mm -hmm. I would just say, like, a way we can move maneuver through this is genuinely understand what happened seek that information fight to understand and want to know about that story because it's something that really did shape america and fed into the racism that america has you know in a different way that's just not black and white or gender or lgbtq plus it's genuine direct mm -hmm. hatred yeah. that happened in such a like a quick timing you know for sure now I, you mentioned afghanistan are you informed on like what's going on is that afghanistan Anybody? Yeah, like yeah. in Afghanistan, like obviously, well, not obviously, a lot of people might not know yeah. that the Taliban like came back right when um, the United States kind of like left Afghanistan. So it just kind of like crumbled kind of after we had like a station there, they kind of left. And so the Taliban came and they just took everything. On September 11th, 2001, I was in my eighth grade social studies class. We were learning about the Civil War, and I remember the teacher suddenly stopped teaching and turned on the news. We saw a plane hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center, and with my eighth grade brain, I truly didn't understand what was going on. And it wasn't until minutes later when the second plane hit the World Trade Center that we all kind of realized something was terribly wrong and that America was under attack. I remember my teacher quickly turning off the TV and she started to cry. 
and she brought it to our attention that there were human beings on those planes and there were hundreds of human beings that worked in those twin towers and they were probably trapped it's a moment that you truly don't forget and then our principal called us all down into the auditorium and tried to explain terrorism to a middle school audience he told us about the attack on the pentagon and then we were all sent home because nobody really knew what was truly going to happen and then i remember it was november of that same year i found out that there was a woman named stephanie irby who actually died on september 11th she worked in the world trade center and i remember reading that she loved star trek just like me and even though we share one name, we have two completely different fates. I think about her every September 11th, and she reminds me to live with intentionality and to hug the people that I love as often as I can, because we truly never know when tragedy is going to strike. I don't know everything that's going on. I've just been seeing like the videos of like people, like the the citizens, like trying to fight their way through security um to like try to go to the airports and trying to leave and like literally handing their own babies to strangers so that they can pass it on and they can like survive because um obviously the Taliban is a terrorist um group and they don't want to stay there and um obviously then there's again like the whole thing with women like um the Taliban don't really think that women deserve to have education or rights like we already know with um Malala. Yeah. Malala. Malala, mm -hmm. yes. We already saw what happened with her when she was shot just for wanting an education. So yeah, a lot of women are scared right now in Afghanistan specifically because um they don't they're fear like everyone is fearful for their life um at the moment in Afghanistan. And yeah. here I've actually never heard the perspective of a Muslim woman like being like during that time of 9-11. Like mm -hmm. I I haven't like I've only seen like people crying, like people next to the Twin Towers, um, and then just people like yes. commemorating it every year. Like this year, I was like looking it up before here, um, and they were like trying to get Biden not to like, not in it, because he was like being disrespectful or something, or people felt disrespected by Biden, and they didn't want him to come to the commemoration. So yeah, I, know, I just feel like there has to be like these stories being told. So this is Miss O'Connell. I was in fourth grade uh, when uh, the attacks on 9-11 happened. The janitor and my fourth grade teacher were the only two male adults in the school almost. So they were good friends. And I was uh, sitting in the middle of class and um, Mr. Rich barges in. Uh, he tells my teacher, turn on the news. You're not gonna believe what's going on. He didn't really say what was going on. He just was like, you're not gonna believe this, turn on the news. Um, so my teacher does and um, you know, we sit there and we watch the news coverage of uh, a plane flying into a tower in New York City. At that point, we didn't really like know what was going on. Uh, so the time before cell phones, like leaving school that day, the fourth graders were pretty much <laughs> the only ones that I uh, knew that something was happening in the world. Um, I think at that point as a kid, I didn't really pick up on um, how this might have been intentional. Um, I left school that day feeling sad and feeling confused. But when I got home, and as soon as I got home, I saw my mom cleaning. She was cleaning like that. She was clearly very scared about something. And that's when I got scared. That's when I knew something was really happening. And over the next few days, as we learned more and more about what was going on, um, my world got a lot bigger and my world got a lot scarier. I remember my bus driver saying at some point that um, they were trying to scare us. And so uh, they would probably attack schools next. And um, I remember watching this guy during recess, like just looking out for planes <laughs> and wondering if I would have to run away um, or wondering if a plane was going to come crashing in during class one day. As an adult, uh, it's kind of weird to realize that there are people who uh, were not around or were not born yet when 9-11 happened because I know that's a day when yeah, the day when the world changed. Um, the world got a lot 
scarier for everybody. And so uh, realizing that there are people who maybe didn't experience the safety that I felt before 9-11 um, exist, yeah. And do you feel like as a generation that you all have been fed one narrative of course, about 9-11? Exactly. Like you said, you see on CNN, you see the, the same footage all the time of the planes hitting or the two t the towers smoking or whatever. So that's what you see. And it's like, America, yes. Um, but really, there are many, many narratives and many stories that, are in, that come out of 9-11 mm -hmm. to make and it. Especially funny because like my parents were not in America. Like I wasn't even born, my sister wasn't even born. They just saw like every country saw what happened because it was like a big moment. Because it's like, oh, America, like they're supposed to be great, but now there's like terrorism happening to them. And so like they only know one story, like because of the news. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't been told that until like I went to Mr. Corrigan's class where I learned like more of like the presidential impact and the whole thing. Like like society was like um, on edge, like you said, from like mm -hmm. everything happening and then. Um, obviously, like the racism that happened after. So. Yeah. Mm. So I think that what I really want to know is how do you think that um, a generation who wasn't born during the time of 9-11 or, you know, hasn't really been around, what uh, message do you think that would you encourage a generation that hasn't, of course, um, been informed correctly of multiple views? What do you think they should do to find out about that, you know, find mm -hmm. out about the stories, um, things like that? Yeah, and I think it, it is things like, seeking out those stories, um, hearing about those different histories, learning about different viewpoints, learning about all the different experiences that people had, because what, what it sounds like is that you have just seen the single narrative about 9-11 and there's much more to it than that. And there are a lot of complexities and a lot of um, different things that happened um, to a lot of different people. All right, well, I wanna thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, yeah. thank you. You were awesome. Um, I think that um, you being there and being able to share your story is just making, you know, the story within itself and you as a person stronger. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Ms. Mechler, for just giving us an insight of 9-11. Um, it's always nice for this generation to hear somebody who actually was there um, during that um, tragic event. Um, and just, I don't know, just thank you for giving us your time. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Mr. Corrigan here again. Before we end the show, let's go back to September 11th, 2001, just one more time. It's been a long day for everyone. The sun is set. It's around 7.30 at night now. The members of both houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, are gathered on the steps of the Capitol building. They look exhausted. It's dark now. Several Congress people speak. The final speaker is Dennis Hastert, the, the Speaker of the House in those days. Now, I need to say that years later, Hastert was in prison for unspeakable lost. crimes against minors. I in no way condone those actions. In fact, I condemn them in the strongest possible terms. But I include his voice here as a matter of historic record. Here is Speaker Hastert. You know, as a nation, as we said, our thoughts and prayers are with those families and those injured and those who are the casualties of today's attack. We also remember those thousands of people who are rescue workers. We ask now that we all bow our heads in a moment of silence and remembrance. Members of the U.S. Congress begin to slowly leave the steps. Some have their arms around each other, some are hugging. It is the end of the loudest of days, and now there's a quiet moment. And in that quiet, the things that divide are forgotten. And unplanned, unrehearsed, unfake, Democrats and Republicans begin to sing together.